thank you, Carol, for, for all the kind words. And it's indeed great to see you again. First, I'd like to talk about some of the design thinking and some of the tools we use at SOM to design our build, buildings in a more intelligent way, more in an energy efficient way. Um, and then I'd like to take everybody on a bit of a journey, as Carol said, to to China to visit three cities. So Nanjing, Xi'an, and Guiyang, uh, which are thriving metropoli in their own right, uh, but don't even make the list of the top 10 largest cities in China, in fact. Um, I thought I'd, I'd share some of what's going on outside of, of Shanghai and Beijing and Guangzhou, these, these places that, that you hear about more often. Um, and, and I think part of this is a bit of self, self-indulgence. I just miss the travel being cooped up uh, here in, um, in our, our COVID quarantine. Uh, and so we're gonna do a bit of a, a trip. So uh, Guiyang means precious sun uh, as translated. And um, it's, you know, with, uh, it's, it's Guiyang itself is emblematic of these cities in China that are, are being, um, are, are, are growing in size and um, being tied into really a global network that I'd like to talk about. And it's driving a, an unprecedented uh, amount of growth. Uh, just to establish some scale here, we see a, a time frame of roughly uh, 140 years of Manhattan itself. Lower Manhattan shown at the top and Midtown at the center, but I think we're astonished to to see uh, the pace and scale of growth that has occurred in a place like Manhattan. By comparison, uh, looking at Shanghai, Shanghai's bund here in a in a um, time period that's spanning roughly. Um, 35 years or 25 years even, we see Pudong going from a uh, essentially low rise warehouse district into this cluster of, of uh, iconic skyscrapers. And if you look out to the, the distance, you see the degree to which that, uh, that urban area has been filled out. And the cities that I'll take you to tonight, one being Nanjing, over that period of roughly the mid 80s to 2020, uh, grew its population by 450%. So going from a, a city of the size of Phoenix, Arizona, to something more like the size of New York City, you can see it sort of expanding into its, its hinterlands. And Xi'an, similarly, it's the same time frame. You can see how it goes from this city in 1984 with a population of 1.4 million to um, in 2018, close to 8 million. So something like the scale of Hong Kong. So 550% growth. And then Guiyang, uh, which grows from a city of just under a million to um, three and a half million roughly. So something akin to the scale of Los Angeles, for example. And it's really only beginning. We're, we're looking at three, 300 billion square feet of new construction in the next 30 years, which will amount to roughly one quarter of all of the new construction in the world. And if we think about the carbon footprint, the environmental consequences of doing this, one has to consider that building and construction are in the neighborhood of 40% of all of the carbon emissions in the world. So do the math quickly, we're looking at roughly 10% of a contribution to those carbon emissions from building and construction in China. So it's important that we get this right and we do it in a responsible and material efficient way. So much of the focus is on cities like Shanghai, and I think we, we all know and love the, the icons that are created there. But much of the construction 
across and growth across China is occurring more at this scale, at low rise and mid rise, high density, uh, where um, infrastructure projects are being planned simultaneously with construction projects, and and there's almost a an industrial scale to the way in which the cities are being produced, um, and. So for our first stop on, on the journey here, we'll go to Nanjing, which you'll see on the map here is um, indicated with a large red dot to the right. So this is roughly two to three hours on a bullet train from Shanghai, so just in from the coast. And Nanjing itself has this rich history and tradition and urban fabric. There's a, a Confucian temple, which you see there on the right. It's, um, it's beloved for its, um, its history and, to, and um, very popular as a tourist destination. And so in expanding this city, the old city center, and this is quite typical for the way in which we see Chinese city, cities growing, the, the old city center is uh, preserved, it is um, kept with its intact structure, but the, uh, the planning and growth is, as, as here, um, done in a strategic way that often uh, connects with transit outside of that uh, city core. So this new Zhangbei core area is an example of just such a master plan. Uh, it, you know, in, in its master plan form, so this is not architecture per se, it's, it's an idea about massing an urban scale. We see a mix of uses, we see uh, an, a, an ecological overlay, a, a greenway network running throughout and uh, a sophisticated transit network as well. And this particular district is planned as a, the China's first hub of healthcare education and research. So there's there's a, a kind of economic master plan that underlies um, a lot of the thinking and, and strategy. So uh, I, I thought I would share a promotional video from the Planning Bureau just showing the kind of optimism, you know, thinking about uh, green finance and um, in particular here, um, a, a center for gene research and associated industries. And again, the, the um, the connectivity with a metro system and comprehensive thinking about planning. And then how does that fit into a larger regional approach, which then fits into the global approach and the, uh, you know, the global economy ultimately. And, and it's this ambition that we see again and again in so many of our, our projects that we're involved with here in China. So here it is under construction and SOM actually um, did the original master plan here around a relatively tight street grid, which uh, facilitates a pedestrian scale, which is, um, you know, we're accustomed to in the US, but um, is perhaps less common in China. So it, it um, has a very urban quality to it. And you get a sense from this photograph of the just the, 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 um, the multi-layered uh, and, and sort of complexity, all of the loading is handled below braid. There's a kind of uh, comprehensive urban approach that's very difficult to imagine happening, certainly at this scale within the US. We were fortunate to win a competition for the landmark tower to, that would mark the center of this district. And you see the, the design on the screen here. Uh, it is uh, 500 meters tall and uh, marks an axis that's an important organizing feature within the master plan. Uh, it, it um, from a, um, an early kind of conceptual approach was rooted in uh, you know, Skidmore and Owings, where, where architects, Merrill was an engineer, were always thinking about the means by which a, a tower of this height in particular, again, at 500 meters would be, would be constructed, conceived and held up. Uh, and this became an inspiration for the tower form and this uh, structural system. 
which utilizes a series of arches, which you see um, periodically at height throughout the tower's um, form. The, the um, strategy for, uh, for creating a stability at this height relies on uh, locating the forces, redirecting the forces to the perimeter, to the corners of the buildings where uh, the building can be most stable given its footprint. If you think about just by analogy, uh, a bar stool to a coffee table, for example, you know, the, the broader base, the wider uh, stance gives much more strength. So these arches that are shown here with the, the red arrows going through them um, carry the forces of gravity periodically for these tranches of 20 floors into the large perimeter columns, which um, then, then uh, create that stability. There was a, a resonance between that arching form and that city wall that uh, encircles the historic center of Nanjing. And, and everyone is um, in Nanjing struck by the beauty of these arched openings that punctuate that city wall. So it, it in a way is a, is a reference to the structural heritage of, of Nanjing itself. And that those, it was important for us that those spaces within the tower become inhabited, you know, become um, feature rooms at the, at the building height. Too often, you know, buildings are just sleek and undifferenti undifferentiated. And there was an idea here that uh, given the, um, again, this uh, design, this uh, structural approach that we could um, give, give some expression to that inhabitation and, and the human scale, even if viewed at, at a distance to, to the overall towers. So these are some of the, the sky lobbies and hotel, a hotel lobby uh, for the, the topmost segment of the building. The, the main arrival experience has one looking out through one of these arched openings and out to the city of Nanjing beyond. And uh, similarly, at the ground level, the lobby is, is column free, with the exception of those large piers to the right and left that you see. Uh, and then again, the, um, the arch redirecting forces outward and creating that sense of arrival. So for, for our next uh, stop on the tour, we'll go to Xi'an, which is um, technically central China, but in many ways feels like it's, it's the edge of the urbanized areas of, of China. And that, uh, you know, much of, much of west of China is, uh, is desert and very sparsely populated. And so Xi'an itself has been that kind of historic um, uh, launching point into uh, points, points uh, west. Uh, it is also the um, origin of the, uh, the Silk Road, the, the fabled Silk Road, and uh, the birthplace of the Han Dynasty, which is the first, basically the first empire, the first emperor of, um, of the Chinese empire itself. So historically a very important place. And that Silk Road, as, as I'm sure you're aware, was was a trade route and it was a um, logistical route that really bound together much of Asia and into North Africa. So there is um, an, an important, an important um, initiative that the, uh, the Chinese government has launched that you may be familiar with, which is the One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, and uh, full disclosure, there is not one belt there's not one road, it is really a network of belts and roads and really a trade network that connects through uh, maritime uh, routes as well as uh, overland routes with the, uh, the extended continent and all the way to, to Europe. So we see uh, the, on the maritime side, these container terminals, Pearl River Delta, for example, you know, one of the world's largest ports being part of that and the, 
this transition railway project, which uh, is stitching together uh, China to all of Europe and and North Africa, and we see some of the um, uh, some of the, the the key destinations on that route. Again, the the um, the lines here are notional, but give an idea of the intent of of the um, this what's thought of as the 21st century Silk Road. So Xi'an itself has this important position as a as a kind of launching point for that Silk Road, and so in thinking of uh, this landmark tower, again, similar in scale to what, what I showed you a minute ago. It's uh, the tower in Nanjing. It's uh, 498 meters. We, we started with an idea about um, a cardinal orientation, this quatrefoil plan, which sort of gazes out in all directions. It, it, it's a pylon that marks this important crossroads and um, and point of, of destination as well. Uh, in, in thinking of the, the design itself, we uh, use some very, very uh, advanced tools in, in shaping it and optimizing its form. What you see here, I'll just replay the, the animation, is a, a transformation of a square form to this quatrefoil shape that I described with the kind of four uh, diagonal axes coming out. The, the optimization process that you just saw animated is something that is an output from a multi-objective optimization process, which we call Moo. And uh, it is, it's a, a tool that we've developed together with MIT to maximize parameters like floor plate efficiency and minimize the amount of structural material that's required given a certain set of parameters for floor plan, for the floor plan, while also considering uh, the, the core, the elevator core, stair core, all of the service core functions. So um, the resulting shape isn't something that we sketched per se, it was something that uh, emerged again from this, uh, this process of optimization and an iterative process of testing these different parameters to arrive at that shape. And so the, the design which you see here uh, clearly bears a resemblance to, to that form and has a unique approach to its expression and structure. Uh, once again, if we think about the uh, the table comparison, or the uh, you know the need to uh, create the broadest footprint and and locate the um, the greatest forces of gravity as far as we can from the center of the tower. We developed a, a series of four blade-like walls, which you see in this in this image, uh, with a kind of silvery texture, and, and the the blue glass is is in between those flanges, it's almost like a, a wide flange beam with the, um, with the, um, the, the flanges being those textured walls on either end. Those are actually um, the main structural walls holding up the tower at, at its edges. And we, in thinking about the articulation of the tower, looked to something very local, which is the, um, Terracotta Warriors, which uh, you, you may be familiar with uh, if, uh, from uh, maybe some, some of the traveling exhibitions that these beautiful, uh, you know, 1500 year old um, uh, sculptures have been have, have made in, in various places around the world. The, the Terracotta Warriors were uh, an, an army of 8,000 statues of armies that were, um, at, well, soldiers that were uh, buried with the emperor to protect him in the afterlife. And so there was a great amount of uh, effort, obviously, um, put into this and the, the, uh, the site in, in Xi'an where, they, um, where the terracotta warriors have been excavated is, is a, one of the most visited tourist destinations in China. 
there, there's this beautiful kind of texture of the, the bronze armor that we see in those terracotta warriors. And again, it's hard not to think of the terracotta warriors for people who are, who are uh, familiar with uh, Xi'an. So it, we, we brought some of this um, inspiration into our expression of the architecture and those flange walls that I, I described before. We once again applied a, uh, together with our, our structural engineering group and our um, digital design group, uh, created this uh, objective, uh, multi-objective optimization script that allowed us to better understand force flows and then develop periodic moments throughout that flange wall, wherein the vertical forces were actually directed horizontally and uh, transferred from one element to, to the other and thereby make, made the structure um, more efficient. So this is not something that we would necessarily intuit, but again, the tool uh, revealed something that, um, that was ultimately more efficient. Uh, so when we talk about things like artificial intelligence and buildings, this is one application of something like that, that kind of K shape or that uh, splayed H shape that one sees there. And so the, we've made those spaces inhabited uh, within the, the design of the building, within elevator lobby, transfer lobbies and uh, uh, hotel functions as well. And you can just get, get a sense of this, the scale of them. Uh, and they become balconies from which one can take in the surrounding countryside of, of Xi'an in the city. Uh, the top, the crown of the tower uh, states this kind of uh, cruciform uh, crossroads geometric relationship and kind of once again becomes a, a balcony or a point from which one can observe those um, those uh, trade routes extending in, in all directions. So the, the building is at far, far left of the image to the lower left. And, and you can see it's part of a network of, um, of uh, highways, transit system and, uh, and parkways that have all been integrated in this, the, the master plan. The, um, the tower, these photographs are from a few months ago, but give you an idea of the, uh, the general structure with the, the concrete core at its center, the floor framing, and then the perimeter walls uh, going up. You can see those, the flanges at each of the, the four kind of diagonal directions from the center of the core. The, um, the cladding of the building has two distinct characters, one very glassy and the other more, more solid and, and uh, textured. And the, <clears throat> those structural walls, as, you know, which are clad within the visual mock-up that you see on the screen here, excuse me, <clears throat> take on some of those bronze tones to make a, a subtle reference to the, the bronze armor of the, the terracotta warriors. So there's a, a kind of subtle but important cultural reference uh, being made here through, even in a super tall to, to uh, the history of the region. Uh, so the, the city that I'd like to take you to next is Guiyang, and this is in South Central China. It is, uh, if, if we talk about one belt, one road, a point of tangency between the two, between the, the maritime and the terrestrial or, or land-based, um, because it, it is an important halfway point along uh, the, the trade routes and, and uh, national transit network that goes through China. It's a, um, it's a beautiful region, which is uh, very, uh, has some very dramatic topography. Uh, it is, it's an eroded uh, uh, plain and has this kind of very variegated uh, set of hills and uh, pretty spectacular architectural or, or and engineering solutions to this uh, varied topography. 
um, it's um, it's frankly a, quite a difficult place to build. Uh, but it was again this point historically from which um, the, um, the, uh, the 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 trade route could continue around some surrounding very tall mountains, and and this picture gives you an idea of some of the characteristic geography of the place. There are these limestone karsts, as they're called. They're uh, you know, actually eroded out of the rock and uh, over time. Uh, but create these otherworldly environments. Uh, so that's the kind of context of Guiyang. Uh, our, our site for the project that I'll describe is, is shown here and looks pretty much um, in this photograph as it did when I first went to visit it. Uh, there was uh, an incredible amount of uh, of a city that had already been constructed, a kind of, once again, in this, this model of building outside of the city center, creating a polynodal city that uh, many people are talking about, the, uh, and, and many cities are considering, the, um, this, this new city is obviously not at the city center. And so uh, it was primarily uh, well under construction, roads there, infrastructure obviously, and buildings starting to be built. And um, this site at the center, at the bed, at the bend in the river, is where uh, we were to design this new center for for the city itself. Uh, you'll see a, a flat area that had been cleared right at the bend in the river, and then a fairly steep. Uh, slide uh, side for of the the mountain that uh, extends up behind this site, and so in thinking of the uh, approach to the site, we look to some of the vernacular of the region, the the Mao villages that uh, would often claim the high ground and and leave the lowland for agriculture, um, and and uh, paradoxically often build up on, on this, the hillsides. And I think we really surprised our, our client, uh, but uh, very quickly he was delighted with the idea that we would preserve the low-lying part of the, of the parcel as it was given for a public park uh, at this bend in the river. And so the plan that you see here uh, has a series of curving and elliptical forms at the lower level, which is this public park with a series of pavilions within it. And then the majority of these 22 buildings that uh, were to, are to constitute the center of this district uh, would occupy the hillside. Uh, and the, the resulting composition is, is like this, wherein the, the the hillside becomes occupied. And uh, this is something that uh, really resonated, I think, with the client because of its um, connection to, again, the traditional uh, urban forms that one sees in Guizhou and around Guiyang, so around the, the province and, and the city. And the foreground then becomes this, this public room with uh, lower rise buildings and recreation spaces, which are connected directly to a riverfront promenade. So within the park, there's a, a feeling of uh, kind of rolling landscape as well. Uh, periodically though features, uh, as you see off to the left, these kind of domed elements, which give light to a series of recreational and shopping spaces beneath the park. So the, the, the public space is occupied at two levels, both on the roof and outdoors, and beneath uh, a series of these uh, indoor rooms that uh, are for public use. On the hillside- I didn't get that. Sorry, Could you try I again? I think that's Siri. So, uh, on the hillside, there's a um, very steep topography. 
and this hillside village, if you will, but in a, in a obviously very contemporary way. And it was interesting to design these small scale buildings, which contained um, both office uses and, sh and uh, shopping retail uses and activate them at multiple levels, which is something that, you, that is, is relatively uncommon in retail. Because, because the hillside was stepping down so much, we get uh, effectively two shop fronts. And, and so that the district, again, these are again, some of the, um, the villages that we were referencing and, and the client uh, was, was particularly uh, taken by in thinking about how we would step down this hillside and create a very unique place for uh, for the people in the new district to to visit and uh, you know something that is distinct because of its connection to the geography of the place. So the client had one request, which is uh, he was um, concerned about the uh, construction quality and in particular about um, uh, uh, that the the culture of construction was in in Guiyang in particular was uh, heavily driven by concrete. So while the tower to be at the center of this district is 380 meters, um, it, uh, it he, he had one request which was that it be built in concrete. So we began thinking about that and returned to, as we often do, a lineup of typologies, this kind of taxonomy of uh, different tower heights and different structural systems that are most appropriate for those heights of building. This was developed by Fosler Khan, an SOM, esteemed SOM engineer, and uh, is still very relevant for for us today. Uh, again, these shouldn't really be viewed as designs, but more as typologies. And so the Guiyang World Trade Center sort of fits between two types, the, the tube and tube type system, which is a um, concrete system and a, and a truss tube system, which we couldn't really do in concrete. So uh, we had a little bit of a, a predicament, structural predicament, if you will. We look back to some of our own um, tube and tube construction, actually the first uh, concrete tube structure here in Chicago, uh, 1965, the Chestnut DeWitt Apartments, uh, first time where that load bearing wall was, was the primary structure. And it, the building looks great today. It has the, maybe these, these beautifully proportioned windows within it have kind of stood the test of time. Uh, and or buildings like One Shell Plaza here in Houston, where the the um, concrete tube is is um, actually transformed. It it re kind of uh, re re reflects the structural uh, forces at play here. You can see a, a floor plan wherein the the depth of the primary structural elements, those little colonnettes, are increasing where the forces are being transferred from the core itself, and that becomes a key aspect of the building's uh, expression. Uh, its neighbor across the street, its sibling, maybe two shell plaza, there's a different take where the, the concrete is uh, uh, sort of deposited, if you will, at the lower portions of the building in this you know, beautiful gradient uh, that expresses the structural forces as they come down and open up to create a ground floor uh, arcade. Another example here in Chicago, the Brunswick building where the, the um, Piano Nobile above the lobby is used as a structural beam or lintel to make that transfer. So, so many, many different approaches that we have. Burj Khalifa, many people don't realize is concrete itself. So we're, um, we were you know, not averse to it and, and embraced this, this problem, if, if you will. Also, the, um, the environmental benefits of using concrete are uh, substantial when one considers a comparison to, um, to a steel frame building. The, the chart here shows the primary building components that go into a tower and, um, and their uh, relative
relative embodied energy. So the amount of energy that goes into their production. When we were working on this project, it was on the heels of a, uh, of a, of a design for a super tall that we had done that was really focused on reducing operating energy. And it became clear that, you know, more than half of a building's energy goes into its construction. So to the extent we could uh, reduce the amount of embodied energy, we would uh, thereby over, overall reduce the energy profile of the building. And so we wanted to think though about how uh, these exoskeleton projects, these, these uh, concrete rigid sh monocoque shells could be um, more intelligent. And, and so we looked to uh, inspiration from, uh, you know, wh whether it's uh, seashells or crustaceans, these, uh, or even bone structure, the way in which material is, is smartly deposited based on forces. And uh, that this is an ongoing theme in much of our, our recent work. So our design obviously much more simple, but takes uh, a tapering form to dilate the floor plates smaller to, um, to create suitable hotel functions at the top and uh, create large, uh, more regular uh, rect square plan floor plates at the bottom. The, the shape is uh, transforming from a soft square, so a square with radius corners, to a, um, an oval at the top of the building. And so it was this kind of optimization process that we went through on interior floor area, uh, the, uh, the size of this lattice, this uh, structural exoskeleton that goes around the perimeter. The, the, the columns are actually subtly reducing floor by floor through their height. So there's a kind of lightening of the structure as it, as it goes skyward. It's a mixed use building. so. Um, the, the lower roughly half to two thirds is, a, is an office building. And then the hotel occupies the, the top third of the building. The floor plan is quite unique in that, uh, and this is, would be a, a floor plan for the office, for example, where in the, the corners are these um, radius, radius edges. Um, but the, the surprising thing is that the, Interior is otherwise column free. There's no interruption in the, um, in the office space by columns, the glasses, inset. So those red boxes are these relatively small considering the height of the tower, uh, frequently spaced um, concrete tube structural columns. So that's the structural skin. Uh, the exterior wall was, um, articulated to express that with slab edges and these kind of heaving profiles of the, the colonnettes, the column elements, which uh, serve the purpose of kind of uh, communicating the, the flows of gravity, but also have an important role in the environmental performance of the building because uh, of this fact of pushing the, ex the structure this exoskeleton into the plane of the glass and in fact on it, be beyond it. Our, our sustainable engineering studio is, um, is prone to pointing this out that more opaque towers are better. Uh, and and we're, by better, we mean better energy performers. You know, so much of what we're building in our cities is our, our glass towers. And while I think uh, Mayor de Blasio's, New York Mayor de Blasio's comment about glass buildings may, maybe wasn't phrased properly. There's some truth to it in that, uh, you know, if we want to uh, be serious about better performing buildings, we need to consider uh, something other than all glass buildings. And, and this would be an example of that. To talk a little bit about the um, the, the, the light levels and daylighting strategy within, within the building and what this additional opacity of the exoskeleton does, uh, we look to an analysis and I'll draw your attention to the left of the screen here where we see that uh, kind of soft square of the, the plan and a 
a red ring around its perimeter. That zone is the overlit zone of the plan. So uh, essentially unusable, it's taking on a lot of heat gain and uh, therefore would require excessive um, cooling and, and paradoxically lighting because very likely the, sh the shades would be drawn. Uh, by comparison, the exoskeleton, which you see uh, in kind of abstract form here, again on the left, uh, dramatically reduces that overlit zone. And we get light levels on the interior that are much more balanced, much more comfortable, not as prone to uh, the variations that we see throughout the day. So just an inherent amount of daylight savings. And, and yet it's not, it's not a dark building and the views are not, are not inhibited by that, uh, those per perimeter colonnettes that form the exoskeleton. Skeleton. This was just a photograph that I took on site, went back when we can travel, and it gives you a sense of what that's, what that's like. Uh, there are no, for those of you who follow structural engineering of tall buildings closely, there are no outriggers in this building. So that, uh, again, getting to our clients' wish to keep this simple, uh, really made, made for a less uh, complex construction and save time in the construction. It's a highly repetitive system throughout. And that, that uh, series of colonnettes becomes a filigree down at the lobby level and a kind of texture filter, uh, again, at the lobby, bringing light in, uh, in a series of uh, kind of vertical, uh, vertical lines and uh, a very tall space, obviously, at the, at the ground level. The, the, the relative clarity of the exterior structure, you know, not impeding the floor plate allowed us to have spaces like this, the, the pool for the hotel that wraps around and has a very clear edge coming out to meet the uh, perimeter columns. I look forward to, to again, getting there when we can travel. And here you see the, uh, the tower sitting on that, that public park. So, what, what I'd like to do is uh, open up to questions, but um, before we do that, um, a few, I'd like to share a few uh, images of the project now under construction. These, these images were from a couple of weeks ago, so, so very recent. And you see the, um, the cladding being applied to the, the structural skin and the um, kind of variation that occurs as the tower begins to taper. I didn't talk too much about the, the buildings in it, that, that sort of flank the tower. It's a, it's a 24 hour city, so um, includes um, many residential buildings, including these uh, that you see here on either side. Uh, the, the two in the foreground have a series of terraces at the top and very special apartments that have panoramic views out on those terraces. And here we see we're flying over the, the park and you can see there were some uh, beautiful uh, historic buildings in the, in the traditional Chinese style that were constructed by local artisans and they're just complete works of art. They're amazing. Um, some of the some of the openings you see here in the, in the park and the domes that I referred to before giving light to those recreational centers uh, below. You'll, you'll note um, at the lower part of the, the screen here of the image, uh, there are buildings in a kind of French style. The, the client was very enamored by some of the uh, French concession architecture of Shanghai and wanted to bring some of that uh, into the the uh, waterfront promenade that, that wraps the bend in the river. There's a, a hotel that's just here on the left that has a courtyard in, in each of its uh, major lobes and sort of a, again, a human scale to the, the buildings that surround the park, something that's just more uh, comprised of stone and uh, you know, natural materials and in a, in a, in a human scale. So I, I understand uh, Carol and the Skyscraper Museum team will make this um, 
these videos in their in their entirety available on the website after the talk. Uh, but I'd like to thank everybody for their time and would be happy to answer any questions. That was fabulous, uh, Scott. Thanks so much. Uh, 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 we got bonus towers uh, even before Giang uh, because we I, I knew that we wanted to do detail on the Giang project and it's really so advanced compared to what I uh, have seen of it when back some five five or six years ago I think you you spoke about it as a project that was just um, underway um, in a uh, a video that or in a talk that he gave that you gave for CTBUH. Uh, and it's amazing how much you realize those ideas that were still in the planning stage um, in the scope of the sustainability features of the tower, but also in the really phenomenal scope of the whole development project. And I wonder if you could help us um, understand a little bit better about the client developer and how he operates on, on this you know, in incredible scale of investment. Um, and in addition, as I tell other people that you can put your questions into chat, and we have probably about 10 minutes in order to be able to do that, and we'll try to feed those into um, the discussion now. Um, uh, could you also, Scott, let um, uh, tell us with that charge of economy and concrete and economy that he gave to you at the very beginning was that realized in, in cost savings on the on the tower um were there in fact per square foot cost savings and how did the tower relate to the to the rest of the development the kind of complementary value added proposition of a landmark tower and then a wider development yeah I, it it absolutely did bear out the economic or efficiency promises. Um, the the team, uh, the construction team, that is, had no issues with um, any any of the superstructure work. Uh, we we struggled with the cladding um, because it's curvilinear and varying over the height of the tower. Uh, but through worked through many mockups and got that sorted out as well. I think um, you know this. This tower plays an important role in creating an epicenter for what is a new outlying district for Central Guiyang, and and um, the the chairman from Zhongtian that I was talking about uh, before, our client, is is a very important person in Guiyang. Uh, growth is obviously, you know, I talked about. 350% growth, the actual physical expansion of the city is of political consequence. It just is because of its the scale and decisions that get made there. And he, as a, um, you know, the, the, the method of delivering projects in China is, is quite different than, than here in that the government is really working together with, um, with the private private industry, and he was a private developer, to realize projects like this. And I, I'm laughing because I think about how many of our clients here in the U.S. would love to have that level of cooperation and support from from government in undertaking projects like this. But you know, he he was in a form, uh, you know, a person of political importance, very very important and um, and influential and I think also wanting to do the right thing uh, the I think that his decision to create a park at the center of the the plan was in part motivated by his desire to give back uh, and and this cluster of historic buildings that you know he he created we didn't design the the uh, traditional house forms but they, they add kind of a texture. And, and again, I think his, his motives um, were, you know, to create a successful public space and a new one uh, all at once. And, and uh, you know, we're getting close. We'll see, see once, it, once it opens um, uh, what the ultimate success will be. Um, we are getting a lot of questions, so I have to kind of peer closely um, at this sidebar, but one is about the embodied energy um, and the, the life cycle um, sustainability issues. And 
And I, I know that you've spoken in the past about the relative um, uh, value of concrete in terms of um, having less embodied energy than steel. So could you elaborate a little bit on, on those points? Right, so um, first of all, all concrete buildings of, of scale have some amount of steel in them. So to, to be clear, it's not obviously all concrete or, uh, but in the case of a, a steel building, it, it almost always is all steel. So uh, the amount of energy to, um, to fabricate the steel, to, to smelt the ore and, or recycle, even recycle the steel is so much higher than what's required for the processing of concrete that, um, that if one wants to reduce the amount of embodied energy in a, in a building, it almost always points to, toward the use of concrete. Uh, so we, we really, we think that concrete is unfairly criticized as a material. It's really all how you use it. And the, the, it's hard to, um, maybe to talk about a concrete structure being light, but the one that we designed in Guiyang is, is very thin for a tower of its height. The amount of material is, is much lower than it would be in, a, in, a, in another structural system, for example. So it, it is how you use it, but it is, um, it, it's, a, it's a good place to start to reduce the overall energy, embodied energy profile of the building. Um, as I peer closely in order to be able to read these other um, questions, China, um, China has a limit of two children per family for many, many years. Cities are growing so fast. Where are all these people coming from um, is, the, is one question. If, if you just want to talk about urbanization and that explosion and how it's impacting yeah. um, the commissions that you're, that you're getting. Yeah, I, um, I, I love being in the middle of dynamic building environments like China's. It's just you know, they're having their industrial revolution now and, um, and the, the 300 billion square feet that I described at the building at the beginning of the talk is, is real. And it's to, to whoever asked that question, it's, it's exactly because of the scale of the population and the fact that now we're seeing an expansion of, of births and of, you know, a, 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 a young population as well. So it's it's not um, there's there's really no end in the short term to this growth. And as designers and engineers, it's therefore you know a fantastic environment to be testing out uh, new tools as those that I shared today. Um, and, and also to do true city planning. Uh, we're, we're always, by the way, partnered with the, the planning bureaus of the cities where we're working. It's not as if we're just working in a vacuum. There's a great deal of infrastructure uh, and knowledge that undergirds all, all of the work that we do. It's a, it's a genuine collaboration, but... Um, I, I think to the person's question, I, I would just agree. It's it's astonishing to to think where where we're going in China. A, a kind of corollary question um, is uh, someone saying, "Well, where are all the companies coming from that are going to populate these buildings?" And this has certainly been a, a criticism in the past about the. Uh, overgrowth perhaps in in some of the cities where where buildings seem not to be finding uh tenancy uh and there seems to be a, a kind of rush to build without a commensurate uh development of a corporate culture so you want to talk about like in inventing spaces for future work um and and how yeah. that impacts uh in the, the business world yeah and i and i think you know, much of that criticism is actually well-founded. You know, there's a lot of space that been, has been built um, on a promise. And um, it's, you know, I've worked in China for uh, 12, 15 years, and I've 
continued to just be impressed with the level of resolve, I'll say. So I, I in other words, you know, the, the amount of uh, upfront investment that China is willing to make in, in cities and, um, and even green infrastructure or autonomous vehicles is, is impressive by anybody's lights. It, it really, um, so I, I guess to answer the question, you know, I, I think, but I'm sure there'll be some areas that, that never materialized, but, um, but I, I actually do, do have faith based on what I see that, um, that the development will, um, will be utilized and those cities will, uh, will see their ultimate kind of, um, you know, realization and inhabitation. It's going to take some time. And, you know, what's happening now in tech is particularly interesting. And, and um, China is, you know, I think um, the uh, Alibaba Pay uh, app has become the number one downloaded app on the app store these days. And, and so it gives you a sense of the potential of the market, you know, I'm a designer. I'm not a. I'm not a uh, an economist, but but what I what I can tell you is from where I sit, it's quite impressive, uh, and and you know, it likely to 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 follow through and transform and and, and succeed. So um, yeah, that's what I would say. But again, I it's hard for me to to comment too too much on politics or economics. Yes, well, I, I think the part of the reason that that we lined up all of the um, people who are speaking in the architect series about their buildings is in part so we can understand the genesis of the design, but also because the way that you um, operate and um, and interact with with clients who do who are the locals who have the vision about what is the future of their city or or their country this kind of the, the interconnectedness that they have, not just to their culture, but to their governments and to their, um, you know, their, their economies in order to really kind of marshal the forces that are much broader across China. And, and, and yet your experience, not and yet, but your experience of meeting these people who really are the movers and the shakers of the society, they are going to shape the built environment that people are going to live in for the next 20 or, or, or 50 years. So um, architects are in a fairly unique position and there's only a small number of architects like you who, who, who are in the kind of you know, room where it happens, where you, you come into, you're invited in competition or you're um, awarded a commission and then you begin to work with a client. Jamie Van Klumberg talked about this last week in his lecture as well, um, about how you work with the CEO or you work with the developer in order to kind of um, you know, find and then realize a vision about what they want the skyline of their city to look like or what their corporation is supposed to communicate in a tower which is so conspicuous um, within the city that it's going to change um, the, the look of the place. Uh, so, um, so, so tell us, you know, kind of what is your experience of being invited to be a kind of, um, you know, futurist um, in a room where you have to balance the, the business and the pragmatism of having an economical structure, but also making sure that you actually are securing this commission and can bring value added about ideas about you know, how, how, how architecture shapes um, a community or a society. Yeah, I, I have the best job in the world. You know, we, we do, you're absolutely right. We go in and, and, um, and get to to shape these amazing and important cities in, at an important time in their in their evolution, um, we uh, I, I can't help but thinking about. By the way, to to everyone on the call, I don't only work in China. Okay, I, I'm 
uh, working here in the U.S. and Southeast Asia, Middle East, you know, many places around the world. And there, um, I, I often um, think about the the kind of freedom of approach that is taken in China. There, there's a kind of rigidity I feel in many uh, areas of the world where we're working at, uh, when it comes to placemaking and uh, and architecture or super tall tower design. There's a sort of formula that's established. And, it, and um, I, I think what one of the things, additional things that's, uh, that's exciting for designers, architects and engineers working in, uh, in China is the, you know, if you can make an argument about efficiency and prove it out, it will be um, likely be embraced. You know, there's there's um, an open-mindedness, perhaps you know, su might be surprising to hear from people, but an open-mindedness to to new ideas um, that you know, if they're well-founded and and rooted in engineering, and I, I think it's you know, it's tr true in some other uh, other cities, other markets, but it's particularly true in China, and I like that ability to. Um, you know, to make measured uh, arguments and uh, present sensible ideas, and then and then ultimately the to be able to execute them together with the infrastructure that I, I described before. It doesn't just stay on paper. These master plans are are you saw the you saw the images. You know, they're actually happening. And um, urban planning in the U.S. by comparison is is relatively tame, right? I mean. The, the scale is, is just something completely different. Uh, so, so yeah, it's exhilarating and it's fun. And, and again, getting to the carbon story, I think, you know, if we can, if we can identify solutions that can, in one project, that can be applied at scale across multiple projects and influence the way that designs are being done in China, then we will have done something good because it's a substantial amount of the built environment that will be made in, in that country in the next decades. Uh, well, we're, we're getting to be over our time. And um, again, we could go on for so much longer um, with discussion on any one of the fascinating points of this project, and especially the young, I think, which connects uh, um, to uh, my particular interest now in, in concrete. Um, and uh, it's something that we're going to talk about a lot about with in particular are the SOM engineers that will reappear in that in that session in the second half of the, the program. But um, it was tonight um, was our topic by my request to Scott to talk about urbanism to talk about this kind of exponential uh, growth uh, uh, through China and which we will be seeing in uh, several of the lectures that follow um, in the series. So um, I Thank you, Scott, for um, for relegating the what I know is so important to you in terms of the sustainability analysis and and the data that you bring to projects and all of the science um, as well um, of that of the sustainability strategy and you know bending to this um, idea that kind of muses about the 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 larger forces of change in places um, that are unknown to us the things that we don't don't see so much but that you have seen by being um, in these rooms and by being involved in in these decisions and in these ideas so um, you've given a lot of dimension to that particular idea tonight and and um, I hope that we're going to continue to explore it over the series as we move into engineering and to um, other other issues that help us to define what's happening in the 21st century with the super tall. So um, thank you for everybody for your patience tonight as we go a little bit into overtime and thanks so much um, Scott Duncan for a really wonderful presentation. So um, everybody, we will see you in two weeks when Brian Lee um, of SOM, um, also of the Chicago office, uh, like Scott, will talk about um, his extraordinary uh, project, the Ch uh, Tian Tianjin Chao Tai Fuk uh, Tower, 
and um, we'll follow uh, next week with a, a lecture by um, on a, a historian on her book, uh, Allison um, fin Finstein, uh, about um, mobility and uh, future cities in the 1920s and elevated highways. So for something in um, what isn't actually completely different, but highly related as a historical precedent, I hope you'll tune in next Tuesday and then come back for the Super Tall series as re we resume in two weeks. So thanks everybody. Night, Scott. See um, everybody thanks, in, um, in, in two weeks. Bye. Hello, everybody. It's six o'clock, um, and so we're about to begin the second in our series, Worldview, Designing Global Supertalls. Um, we're already joined by some 54 people. I hope that um, everybody's going to be able to get into the meeting. There's been um, a typical glitch at the last moment of um, completely unpredictable things, but hopefully um, you, um, everyone has seen our uh, urgent uh, new link for this uh, particular meeting. Um, I, um, I'll, I won't waste more time with excuses of things that seem to be completely beyond our control. But nevertheless, welcome, um, welcome to our uh, Zoom enabled worldview where in little boxes we talk about traveling um, to, uh, to parts international to far-flung cities, to places we don't know, we've never been, and in the case of uh, Guyane, um, a place, uh, a city of some four million people whose um, name um, I don't even know how to pronounce correctly. So we're going to learn a lot tonight, uh, and that's a good part of the purpose of this, um, this lecture series, to, um, to try to get up to date on some of the vast changes um, in the world of skyscrapers and super talls that have been um, effectuated in the last two decades, but especially in about the last 10 years, um, sometimes very conspicuously in buildings like the Burj Khalifa, you know, the competition for the world's tallest, but also ubiquitously uh, in Chinese cities and in Middle Eastern cities and in cities around the world. So I'm going to um, just very briefly before I introduce um, our speaker tonight, Scott Duncan, sh uh, show on a couple of other screens, um, uh, slides, some of the towers that are the focus of our lecture series. And that's in particular because they're also featured buildings in our exhibition, Super Tall 2020, which we dearly hope will be open to the general public, um, sorry, uh, uh, by around April when we hope the gallery will be um, open again in a, in a increasingly post-COVID uh, era. So last week, Jamie Von Klemper talked about two Super Talls that he designed the uh, China Resources Tower, which is the one that you see on the far left of our lineup here of featured towers, as well as Lotte World Tower in Seoul, which um, was featured in, a pre in the previous exhibition of Super Talls, which was way back in, in 2011. A lot of buildings have been added to the list, more than 30 of what we call Super Talls of 380 meters or more. Um, and the second one in the lineup that you see here, um, Scott Duncan will talk about tonight. It's his design for the um, Guian World Trade Center Landmark Tower, which is the landmark in the center of a complex master plan of 22 buildings that are all simultaneously under construction now. And at the end of the of the talk uh, about the kind of design concept um, and some of the special premises of, of his towers around sustainable values, which is one of the reasons we especially wanted to, to feature this building. Um, he will show us some, some footage of the towers on, under construction. Um, and then you see in the rest of the lineup, some of the, uh, the uh, extraordinary buildings um, for their um, formal invention, for their structural invention, for their beauty, and for, um, I think, a characteristic of, of formal exploration and expression that characterizes 
um, a good number of the towers of, of the last decade. So um, just by way of showing you um, the, the lineup that's coming up in the, in the, the next um, 10 weeks or so, you can find these easily on our website and click on and make your reservations um, then. But our next talk by Brian Lee, um, also of SOM, like, like Scott Duncan, uh, we'll talk about Tianjin, another city that I think is not that well known to Americans. Um, and then Rob Whitlock from KPF will talk about um, three of the super talls that he's designed, but most particularly the tallest building in Beijing, uh, the, um, the, the CITIC headquarters, also called uh, China Zun. Then in Kuala Lumpur is rising a new tallest tower, and that's designed by Carl Fender, uh, an Australian architect. And um, we've just added, and it's one of the reasons I wanted to use the schedule um, to post the schedule here for you, we've um, we've added an additional lecturer uh, to the architect series, and that's Adrian Smith, um, who is the principal designer of eight super talls by our definition, um, and will give a lecture as kind of an overview of some of um, his, his design um, principles and, and objectives. So we're excited to have, have um, filled out our, uh, our lineup of extraordinary architects and their buildings um, with Adrian Smith. Um, and then I won't talk about now because it'll take too long to praise all of the, uh, the engineers um, and the other building professionals um, like the, the, the builders and construction managers who will populate the second half of our series. Um, tonight, though, um, I'm particularly um, proud and pleased uh, to, uh, to introduce Scott Duncan. Um, with, so it's with both pride and great affection um, that I introduced him to you tonight because um, with pride in particular, because Scott is the designer, not just for this particular tower, which is the first one that he's got under his belt as a super tall of 380 meters or more. He has another one that's just beginning um, construction as well that in uh, Nanning. Uh, and he's, he's designed many more. Um, but I've known Scott for a little more than 20 years um, because he was the uh, associate um, so the junior associate uh, uh, at SOM, working on his very first project out of Harvard Graduate School of Design. And his first project was um, to oversee the drawings and the, um, the development under Roger Duffy, the architect of the Skyscraper Museum. So, so Scott was um, our day-to-day our -day architect. He made all the drawings. He detailed the cases, the very cases in which the model of Guiang Landmark Tower now sits proudly as one of the featured buildings in our show. So with those particular bookends of his first job and now um, his, his first um, individually designed um, uh, architecture uh, included in an exhibition in the museum, um, it seems like a, a, you know, a, a quite a, a journey as they say. Um, so speaking of journeys, we want to go um, with Scott through his explanation of um, getting the job in Giang, um, the challenge of kind of coming to terms with a, a city, which as he'll describe is, is growing um, phenomenally, astronomically um, in scale. And then some of the other places that he's working in China, which are kind of third tier cities um, by the the kind of Chinese metropolitan um, definition um, and present, um, opportunities and challenges which are somewhat different than the, uh, than the, the um, more well-known global centers and global cities um, like Shanghai um, or Hong Kong. So um, I am introducing Scott Duncan, who you see um, just below me on the screen and his camera. Um, he'll talk for a moment um, and then um, turn the camera off so that you're gonna enjoy all of his images at full screen. So um, here's um, Scott Duncan.